Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're catching up on Kakaako today. And we have Lee Sichter, a, a planner and a lecturer in the urban planning department at UH, uh, to talk about uh, the planning considerations around uh, Kakaako, Kakaako Makai. Welcome to the show, Lee. It's nice to see you. Thank you, Jay. It's good to see you again. So let's talk about your familiarity. I mean, this may be an understatement of familiarity. You are intimately familiar with Kakaako. You have studied it for decades and decades. Can you talk about your familiarity with this area and with the planning considerations around this area? Uh, before I became a lecturer at the University of Hawaii, I was uh, in a consultant in the field of planning for uh, 39 years. And 23 of those years was with a large planning firm that actually our offices were in Kakaako. And at the time that I was with that planning firm, we did a number of projects in association with the Hawaii Community Development Authority, the authority over uh, seeing uh, Kakaako, uh, including uh, consideration of various amendments to the rules. Um, and then in uh, 2012, after I had left that firm and opened my own consulting practice, I was retained by HCDA, awarded a contract to do the transit overlay development plan for Kakaako and the accompanying environmental impact statement. Uh, so I have uh, I've been involved with uh, issues in, in Kakaako for at least three decades. Mm, wow. So uh, the, uh, the plan in what, 2012, can you talk about that? What did that say? What, what considerations did it take into account? Well, first of all, the, 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 the 20, when we started the work in 2012, it was uh, restricted to the Mauka area. Uh, because uh, the focus was on how should uh, the rules for uh, Kaka'ako's uh, uh, HCDA, uh, how, what do they need to take into consideration for the arrival of the rail in Kaka'ako? So it was a transit-oriented development plan to respond to the uh, anticipated arrival of uh, three rail stations in the Mauka area of Kaka'ako, meaning the area uh, landward of Alamoana Boulevard. Was there a plan at this point or that you knew about for Kaka'ako Makai? Uh, yeah, I believe that the uh, HCDA had uh, already established a plan for uh, Kaka'ako Makai. Um, I only peripherally was involved with uh, the details of that plan. Um, I had a client who did the renovations for the gold bond building which is in the Mackay area. So I did the permitting for that and uh, uh, had to peruse the previous plan, but uh, I've not been intimately involved with the plan. Did the, did the previous plan, to your knowledge, uh, include any residential or a high-rise condominium project? Well, uh, I don't believe so, but there was a proposal back uh, 20 or so years ago uh, to build a couple of... Uh, high-rise uh, residential towers in the Mackay area, and uh, it uh, it generated a lot of controversy, and ultimately um, uh, the plan was uh, abandoned. Now, I, I don't know if you recall, but uh, that was the A and B plan, and there were at least two towers, maybe more, um, and uh, A and B took a lot of heat for that plan, and, and one afternoon on a Wednesday, uh, the CEO, Stan Kuriyama, called me up and said, I want to come over to your radio show at KHPR, and I, and I want to I have a hot scoop for you. I said, Stan, you're always welcome here. He came over, and at 5 o'clock that afternoon, he announced that A and B was pulling the plug on that plan. <laughs> for lots of considerations, including community sentiment. Right. Right. There was a, a lot of concern about the impacts on Point Panic. I remember John Kelly and Save Our Surf were one of the original uh, groups that uh, came out in opposition to that plan. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so what's uh, now 2012, I think is the same year that uh, Neil Abercrombie made his uh, uh, deal with OHA and uh, for uh, a, a debt, a perceived debt of $200 million, he, he, he uh, exchanged that um, for land, a number of parcels in. Kaka'ako, Makai. Do you remember what happened? Do you remember whether, you know, uh, where, that, where that fit in all of this? 
you know, uh, it, the, the plan was, as I understand it, uh, to compensate Ka, Ka, uh, compensate OHA for the uh, revenue that uh, uh, they're supposed to be uh, paid uh, from ceded land. Uh, and uh, it was supposed to be a fundament, funding mechanism for, for uh, OHA. Uh, and uh, the proposal was that uh, OHA would be compensated by uh, receiving uh, development rights to the land. Uh, in the Mackay area, and uh, that valuation was placed at two hundred million. But I don't know how that valuation was arrived at. Uh, some consideration for highest and best use, and highest and best use probably would have included residential development. Meaning, you make more money with residential development, right? right. But but there was a there was a statute that uh, prohibited residential uh, construction, residential development in, in uh, Kakaako Mackay. Where does that fit? Well, I think the legislature waited in uh, as a result of the controversy and uh, enacted uh, legislation that uh, restricted residential development to uh, only the Mauka area. In other words, prohibiting residential development from the Makai area. I believe that was in response to all the controversy. Mm. Uh, that, that, with that, would you agree with me that that statute was in force before Abercrombie made his deal with OHA? I think that's correct. Okay, well, let's go. Let's go forward. So that was uh, eleven years ago. What's happened? Well, I understand that there's been a bill introduced this session that proposes to uh, uh, reverse that uh, prohibition, that previous legislative prohibition, and uh, allow residential development in Kakako, and at the same time increase the uh, uh, existing height limit to four hundred feet. That that'd be forty stories, roughly. Approximately right. yeah. stories. So let's let's talk about the substance of, of of the project from an environmental point of view, and um, I guess the Hawaii Environmental Protection Act. Um, what is what is remarkable, if anything, about about uh, these parcels? That is uh, Kaka'ako Makai that differentiates this area from other areas, um, you know, uh, in Kaka'ako and for that matter, uh, in and around the downtown area of Honolulu? Oh, two things come to mind, Jay. One is its location. Uh, well, both are related to the location. One is that it is shoreline property, uh, immediately adjacent to the shoreline. Uh, but the second and uh, uh, larger consideration is the uh, uh, the former use of the Mackay area that dates back uh, uh, probably close to 100 years, and that was that the entire Kaka'ako Makai area is uh, fill material, and uh, it was also the site of a uh, uh, basically a dump, uh, a landfill, if you were. And uh, it's been since determined that there has been a lot of toxic material dumped into that uh, that landfill. So, uh, in recognition of that, you know, several decades ago. Uh, HCDA, when they uh, developed uh, a portion of the Kakako Makai, um, they uh, remediated the, the dump site into what we now know as the Waterfront Park. And uh, the Waterfront Park is actually a, a, a large mound. It's not a flat parcel at all. And if you were to look very closely, uh, you can actually see uh, vents that were constructed at the top of, of the mounds in the park that uh, enable the venting of methane gas uh, to prevent underground fires. So uh, the park today is the uh, reuse of a former landfill site. And uh, it's since been determined uh, that uh, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, toxic material that's still you know, buried in that landfill site, which uh, raises a lot of considerations about uh, what's the quality of the underlying soil in the uh, area surrounding the landfill itself. Yeah, I have a couple of things about that. If I, if I give you a landfill with materials that are toxic, and this was rubbish and who knows what kind of rubbish, but it was the, the rubbish product of the city for many years. Um, does that go away over time? Does it uh, somehow ameliorate itself? Or does the toxicity continue? 
Uh, I'm not a scientist, but my planning experience tells me that uh, the toxicity continues. It uh, it doesn't diminish over time. There's been plenty of cases on the mainland with uh, toxic sites having to be entirely remediated before they can be used. And that remediation uh, uh, may be as much as having to remove all the toxic material. Uh, if this was, a, and it was, uh, a, a rubbish landfill, um, it's going to be pretty deep, isn't it? Uh, you know, for all the years that it was used as a landfill. And the topsoil on top of it will be relatively a small percentage of, of the material. Uh, would you imagine I'm right about that? Well, I'm not sure how deep it goes. Uh, uh, obviously, it goes 40 or 50 feet above the grade, which is the reason there's a large mound. Uh, the whole area, the Makai area, as well as you know, many por portions of, uh, of the shorefront of Honolulu, downtown Honolulu, are fill land. But in this particular instance, uh, this this fill land also included a landfill, and I, I cannot say with certainty at what point they started filling the Makai area in with material that is in fact toxic. So mm -hmm. it's hard to say how deep it. It, it may go and how much that uh, toxic material got compressed over the years and, and might have gone deeper. It's just very difficult to say. Yeah. So um, when you say remediate, uh, uh, my understanding is that, that it may require, although it's, this is not a, you know, a scientific determination just yet, it may require digging all of that out, however deep it is. Oh, that would be one way. Right now, the remediation was a minimal remediation. That was basically to cover it up and use it as a passive recreational use, a park. Uh, if you... More extreme remediation would be to actually go in and uh, excavate all the material out and uh, remove it. Uh, and that, of course, is obviously quite expensive and time-consuming to do. So if, if I have, um, you know, this landfill condition, and I want to build a 40-story condo, I would have to go much further than just putting topsoil on it, right? Well, I, I don't think there's any proposal to build a uh, condominium tower or residential tower on the site of the landfill itself, where the park is. I think that the proposal is to build it in a, uh, an adjacent area. The question is how what are the actual physical limits of the uh, old landfill? And then secondarily, how much has the toxic material in that landfill leached out horizontally or spread out to the surrounding areas? I think that's very, very difficult to say unless there's really detailed analysis that's done, soil testing. You're talking about the, the, the toxicity of the uh, material in the landfill, right. leaching out to the water table, to other water sources and infrastructure that may uh, service other areas. Am I right? That's right. And also just permeating out laterally as well as, uh, as vertically, horizontally as well as vertically, spreading out, if you will. Uh, you, know, you just imagine that the rainfall soaks into the ground and uh, it, it spreads out. So if it's carrying... Uh, uh, toxic material, uh, it, it has the possibility of spreading out. When we say toxic material, which, I mean, just in the common use of the term, um, that's, that's poison. Um, that could make you sick. Uh, that could be carcinogenic. Um, we, don't, we don't know, but uh, is it possible that if you start doing construction in this area or near this area, you will unleash toxins that will hurt people? I, I think it is possible. Uh, I have a I have a slightly different concern, and that is, uh, you know, we've seen plenty of buildings in in downtown Honolulu built on on former fill land. That's that's not a constraint. Um, uh, the preferred method of construction is uh, pile drive uh, piles, driving piles down into the soil to create st stability for the foundation. My concern is if you are driving piles through land that is potentially contaminated, are you in fact introducing that contaminated land to a lower depth? In other words, actually driving it down or creating 
by the by the piles themselves, creating ways for water to percolate deeper than it normally would? Are you in fact disrupting the soil in such a way that could create uh, uh, cracks or fissures, or just by putting deep piles in, introduce what may be at one layer into a lower layer? layer? Now, I understand there are two aquifers below Makai uh, Kaka'ako. The upper one is uh, uh, non potable, non drinkable water, but the lower one is drinkable water. And I would be concerned about the uh, introduction of any uh, uh, toxic chemicals that reside in the landfill into deeper substrata and bringing it closer to the aquifer. I think that would have to be carefully studied. So you'd need to know what the construction technique of the, the proposed tower or towers would be, and then what impact that construction technique might have on the subsurface. That's, if that happened, that would be pretty scary. That would affect the water supply. Uh, an aquifer is the water supply, isn't it? Yeah, I think the whole Red, Red Hill uh, 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 concerns over the last several years have heightened everybody's consciousness about uh, the uh, fragility of our uh, aquifer and how uh, easily it is exposed to contamination. So I think we are all in a heightened sense of awareness about uh, the need to protect our aquifers. Yeah. So uh, what about other environmental considerations here? I mean, for example, we know plenty of evidence and research at UH uh, about, um, about uh, you know, climate change and sea level rise along this very shoreline. What effect does that have on the possibilities for development? Well, there's always, you know, in the in the in the literature, and when we're dealing with uh, issues about sea level rise, you have three options. You have uh, abandon, mean meaning don't use the land; it's it's going to be subjected to sea level rise. Go somewhere else. Uh, defend, which means put up some kind of a wall to prevent the sea from coming in, or adapt, and that means learn to live with it. Uh, adaptation is the likely outcome. Uh, in our coastal areas of Honolulu, we're going to have to learn to live with a higher sea level, which means you might end up with a Venice kind of situation where the water actually is uh, uh, a companion feature of the of the urban area. That raises a concern about not just the mitigation of how do you deal with uh, a rising sea level with a single structure, but more importantly, pedestrian and vehicular access to that structure. What does the roadway network look like in that kind of uh, uh, consideration? In the Kaka'ako Makai area right now, it's a commercial area, uh, warehouses and some commercial, and there's uh, a degree of uh, uh, traffic, but mostly vehicular, not a lot of pedestrian traffic, except around the uh, medical school. Uh, but if you're introducing a, a significant residential component to that area, you're really changing the transportation character of the area. And you have to take that into account if you are experiencing sea level rise and potential uh, periodic flooding in the area in the future. So it's a consideration that would have to be you know, taken into account with any kind of development proposal. Yeah, and aside from the uh, research um... Uh, you know, for the uh, uh, examining the environmental factors uh, in in the development proposal, in the um, the specifications for a permit to develop, um, you would have to make changes from uh, the existing specifications as they now exist, and it would be uh, pretty substantial. I would say, I would imagine. Um, because uh, of the, for example, the need to raise the building up, the need to raise the soil up, the need to build new infrastructure. Um, that's costly. And that kind of cost would have to be built in either into the budget for, uh, for the state, as the case may be. The state has spent plenty of money already years ago on infrastructure in Kaka'ako, both Makai and Mauka. Um, but then this would have to be paid by the developer and ultimately by the people who buy the units in the developed project. 
And that would mean the units are more expensive because the specifications require um, you know, more substantial, more high-tech, more cutting-edge um, type infrastructure. Am I right? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct, Jay. Uh, you know, the state isn't, hasn't been in the business of building high-rises, uh, but uh, I've been in the business of representing uh, uh, clients that do build high-rises. Uh, let me give you an example. I represented Hilton Hawaiian Village for many years and uh, did the uh, permits and the environmental impact statement for the uh, the Grand Waikikian Tower uh, at uh, Hilton, as well as the Kalia Tower. And when we did the Waikikian Tower, uh, the city uh, uh, commented that the, the sewer line uh, in the area was inadequate, and Hilton was pegged with having to replace the sewer line under Ala Moana Boulevard, extending all the way up to uh, Kalakaua Avenue, which was quite a pretty penny. Uh, that's a cost that the developer had to absorb. In the case of Kakaako Makai, there may be a lot of infrastructure uh, improvements that would be required to service uh, new residential development, and that has, is added on to the price tag of whatever the cost of those buildings are and ultimately added on to the, uh, the the cost of individual units, which is passed on to the consumer. Yeah, so affordable may, may be a, a term uh, that changes in its dollars and cents meaning. Uh, uh, true. Uh, we are always pushing that, uh, you know, affordability is that 80 to 120 percent of uh, 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 the average uh, median income, and uh, we're always pushing that 120% side because uh, it's it's really expensive to build cheap, affordable housing. I know that sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> someone's got to be paying for the development of the, the cost of building it, and then if you pass that cost on to the future buyers, that price tag is just going to go up. I, what's interesting too is that uh, this. This, uh, these parcels are very close to the weather shoreline parcel. They're in a uh, right now in a pristine area, um, an area which would be very valuable, uh, as much or more value than any other short shoreline parcels, shoreline projects in the state. Uh, right there in, in this iconic place with the beautiful ocean, sunset, what have you. Uh, <clears throat> that's that allows the developer. Uh, to set the price uh, to a market that's very high, very, very uh, uh, attractive. Yeah. And so, you, so on the one hand, you have additional costs. On the other hand, you have additional value. And uh, it seems to me, you know, years ago, they were talking about uh, uh, doing, doing residential development on Aloha Tower. Uh, and they were talking about units there that would cost $5 million a piece, and that's 20, 30 years ago. Um, right. These units would be very, very, very expensive, and it takes us still further from affordability, doesn't it? Well, uh, the issue, Jay, is uh, uh, if you're going to build a, a, a affordable unit, uh, you basically have to subsidize the cost of those units. Uh, otherwise, the price tag on them is just too high. So Someone has got to pay for the cost of those units and then turn around and pass them on as much cheaper units. That's a subsidy, essentially. So the, the question is, who is going to subsidize those units and how much is it going to cost to subsidize those units in order to make them available to lower income um, potential uh, buyers or renters, for that matter? Very complex and unknown at the moment, I'm sure. So well, yeah, um, it, that just raises the whole point, Jay. That uh, uh, when I did the transit-oriented development plan for Kakaako, uh, because the the land uh, in Kakaako is owned by the state, and uh, because the uh, plan was being proposed by a state agency, uh, we we were obligated to do an environmental impact statement for the uh, transit-oriented development plan. So we started the plan in 2012 and uh, finished the first draft of that plan in 2013. And at that point, we had to prepare an environmental impact statement for the plan. 
And after that whole process was completed, then we could finalize the plan, the TOD plan. The same consideration is going to have to apply for anything that happens in the Makai area of Kaka'ako. Once OHA develops some kind of a plan for the Makai area, then a environmental impact statement evaluating the impacts of that plan is going to have to be conducted uh, before any plan can be implemented and executed. So a couple of questions about that. It's a sequence thing. So first you make a plan that people are in general comfortable with. And I guess that would be a lot of people, a lot of constituencies, because this is so iconic for so many people. It's not just the, um, you know, the, the scientific community, um, the planning community, it's the surfing community, it's the native Hawaiian community, it's so many people. And people like me who walk my dog in the park, and it's, very, it's a treasure to me. Um, all those people have to be accounted for. But once, once you talk to them all, let them weigh in on it, then you have a plan. Then you take a plan and you make an EIS with some um, you know, various environmental factors, maybe a lot of them, because this area is complex. And there may be more environmental factors for this area than you know, a lot of other areas. And then you may, you may wind up changing the plan because of what is determined by the EIS. Uh, and then you may need to, as I mentioned before, you may need to um, change the specifications for construction uh, so that, you know, it's the, the, the property is protected from whatever environmental risks are identified. And, and then um, you have to have the government agencies involved, whoever is involved, um, uh, make changes in the specifications fair is fair, you know, for the issuance of, of a permit for this construction. So uh, first, do you agree with that sequence? And second is, how long would that sequence take? Well, it, I agree with the sequence, and it's actually a little more rigid than that. Under the state law, for an EIS, you have to consider alternatives. You have to evaluate alternatives to the proposed action. So let's say, for example, the proposed action is two 400-foot residential towers. At the time that you're doing an environmental impact statement, you have to, you are obligated under the law to consider alternatives to that proposed construction project. So, and that has to be a rigor rigorous evaluation of those alternatives. It can't be superficial. So um, it took us about two and a half years to do the environmental impact statement for the, uh, the Mauka area. Um, one to two years is the, the running average. There are uh, formal rules that you have to follow. It's called Administrative Rules, Section 11-200. And uh, it specifies hydrological reports, geological reports, socioeconomic analysis, archaeological analysis infrastructure analysis, climate change analysis, cultural analysis. These are all requirements for EISs that are specified in the law. And you have to take the time to do all of that work. One of the longest, most detailed processes in that all those reports is actually the cultural impact statement that has to be produced because it requires not only identifying who are uh, uh, people who that are culturally affected and what resources are protected, but then actually interviewing them, transcribing those interviews, getting their approval of those transcriptions, and then incorporating all that information. A cultural impact assessment alone can take six months to a year to produce. Hmm. Why am I thinking of Mauna Kea? Because in that <laughs> case, the yeah. same OHA uh, demanded a cultural you know, a cultural component to the EIS. They demanded the EIS. It took a long time. They never accepted it. The same OHA, wasn't it? Am I am I missing something? I don't I don't know to what extent OHA was involved with the Mauna Kea issue. I believe it was, but I really I did not ever take a look at who all uh, who all the stakeholders were that actually participated. I'm only most aware of the people who were protesting. Hmm. Okay, so. 
from the time you start making a plan, current plan, um, to the time you finish that, to the time you start an EIS and, and finish that, including the cultural component, to the time that you, you, uh, you ask the uh, regulatory agencies, the building permit agencies, uh, to update and uh, you know uh, improve their specifications for a building permit. Uh, how much time would go by before you got to the point where those those things were updated and a permit was applied for and um, you know could be granted? What are we talking about? Five years? Ten years? What? Well, let me give you an example for the TOD plan that I did. We started in 2012. We uh, finished the draft uh, of the plan in 2013, and then we took two years to do the EIS, got that approval. The finalized plan has still not yet been adopted by the Hawaii Community Development Authority. So, and we're in 2023. So that's over 10 years. Um, just the fact that you uh, do a, a draft plan and then evaluate it through an EIS doesn't necessarily mean that the final plan is going to actually be adopted. There still might be concerns. So this process does tend to take a long time. The going rate for these kind of projects is about eight years, and they could take longer. Um, we have a lot of rules and regulations in Hawaii that make development the development process very difficult. Who pays for the EIS? Uh, whoever the applicant is. So if I'm the developer, then I have to pay for it, even if it takes a long time and That's involves a lot, a lot of input. That's correct. That's correct. So the question, you know, before we have to run here, but the question is, uh, uh, all of this considered, everything we've talked about, is this a good time for the legislature to address this issue? Um, it seems to me so much more has to happen um, before the legislature addresses this issue, uh, it, it may be that this is just the wrong time, and and we have to wait and see. What do you think? Well, I, I think that the uh, legislative intervention at this point is premature. Uh, the chapter three forty three says uh, that an EIS shall be if it's if it's required, and in this case it would be required because it's uh, state land and it's by a government agency. An EIS shall be conducted at the earliest practicable time. So before there's any legislative intervention about the uses in Kaka'ako Makai, I think it would be prudent to wait for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to produce the requisite environmental impact statement. And the law also says that the purpose of our environmental law is to ensure, and I quote, that environmental, economic, and technical concerns are given appropriate consideration by decision makers. So the law says that we need to use the uh, environmental impact statement process in order to, to inform decision makers. So in my mind, it's clearly premature to be uh, discussing particular land uses uh, in Kakako Makai until a conceptual plan for those uh, uh, land uses has been uh, uh, done and circulated, and then that plan subjected to a rigorous environmental uh, impact statement. Yeah, no question about the EIS, because this is state land. And Correct. for that matter, OHA is a state agency. Correct. Well, thank you, Lee. Uh, great to talk to you. It's nice to catch up with you. And indeed, that's the name of our show, Catching Up on Kaka'ako. And in some ways, that's catching up with Lee Sichter. <laughs> I'm delighted to spend the time with you, and I hope we can get together on other things uh, soon um, enough. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.